pray, gracious and loving God, on this Reformation Sunday. Let this time be fruitful and helpful as we learn to read Scripture and read Scripture together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. So, we have been working on understanding how to read Scripture, making Scripture more accessible. So I thought since today is Reformation Sunday, we should get some help from Martin Luther. And this is something that uh, I wanted to present to you anyway when we talk about Bible basics, which is, like I mentioned, at the beginning of the fall, what everybody was wanting more of. So, first things first, let's talk about the power of of the Word and the place of the Word in our lives. So I've got some Luther for you to listen to. This is from a writing called, I forget the exact name of it, but it was something Luther put together after he had received the official bull, papal bull, where you know you're a heretic, you got to recant in so many days or else. And Lots of his writings had begun to be burned. And so then a bunch of students in Wittenberg, they went out outside the gate and they burned the papal blow and some other writings. So tit for tat a little bit. And of course Luther had to defend himself. And in the midst of that defense, this is what he said. One of the things he said, I'm willing to let everyone have his own opinion. I am moved most by the fact that the Pope has never once refuted with scripture or reason anyone who has spoken, written, or acted against him, but has at all times suppressed, exiled, burned, or otherwise strangled him with force and bands, through kings and other partisans, or with deceit and false words of which I shall convince him from history. Nor has he ever been willing to submit to a court of justice or judgment, but at all times I don't know what that word means. And that he was above scripture, kind of plain or like a baby balling. Oh, yeah, sorry. As a baby, I was a perfect baby. I never cried. I never bawled, I never bawled at all. Um, that he was above scripture, judgment, and authority. Of course, this is Luther's um, uh, take on the situation, but what is Luther asking for? He wants to have a debate on what the scriptures have to say. That's where he wants it to go. Now, unfortunately, Luther, just like the church leaders, they were not too kind to each other. If you think the lack of civility is bad now, you should have lived 500 years ago. It was worse, all right? So, nonetheless, I put this up here for you to say, again, this was the, our conviction that script, the place of Scripture is that it, it's supposed to be the source and norm for our faith in life. Um, but what, probably more, yes? <laughs> On that previous one, was yep. that a deliberate slur to not capitalize over? Um, Evidently, if it's in English, it was that way in German, and I probably was. Again, Luther's going to bring down the status of the Holy Father. Although, at this time, he still believed in the Pope. He still thought it was, he was the, the leader, and, and actually, I think even, although at this point, he's pretty much, this is the last, this is the last straw, but up until this time, he thought, you know, I think we can get everybody together here. Let's debate on what Scripture teaches, what tradition is, and let's work this out. But at this point, he's kind of thrown in the towel. After all, his writings have been burned, and then he burns canon law and some other things. So, um, yeah, this is, a, this is a sad moment, really, because this is a, a place where um, one of the many crucial moments where things, you know, the split happens. Um, but now, let's, what does Scripture do? What does the Word do? This is a wonderful, powerful statement from Luke. If a touch of Christ healed, especially with today with blind Bartimaeus, if a touch of Christ healed, how much more will his, this most tender spiritual touch 
this absorbing of the Word. I love that language. That the Word, the Scriptures, absorb us. Communicate to the soul all that belongs to the Word. And again, when Luther's got a capitalized word, he's talking about Scripture, he's talking about Jesus, he's talking about a proclamation, a me the message of the Gospel. This, then, is how through faith alone, without works, the soul is justified by the Word of God. So the Word of God is what, is what makes all of this happen. We're sanctified. Think about our conversation last week about sanctification. It being a past tense thing. We're sanctified, made true, peaceful, and free. Filled with every blessing and truly made a child of God. And he quotes um, <clears throat> the first chapter of the Gospel of John. So, I love, I love um, this phrase, absorbing of the Word. And how does it happen? By the Word. The Word of God is the ultimate sacrament. It's the ultimate means of grace. And this is how every the benefits of Christ, what He's done for us, comes to us. is through the Word. Through Jesus, through the proclamation of the Gospel, through the, the Scriptures. It's, we get absorbed into the Word. And so that's the power of it. So, that's the place and the power of the Word. Now, what's the key to you getting absorbed into the Word? What's the key to you engaging with the Scriptures? Well, Luther says that it's the key. The key is knowing to distinguish two things. Some of you Luther scholars, what is it? Marietta can't say. <laughs> Law and the Gospel? Greg? Law and the Gospel? Hey! hey. There it is. Mary Ann told me. Oh! <laughs> the law and the gospel. We're going to look at what Luther has to say about this, because oftentimes we talk about what he has to say. And as you know, through that year-long class I did on the Reformation, my goal was to actually let you read Luther. There's way too much stuff about Luther. Just read it. This is the main thing. So, we're going to hear some of Luther, um, but really when you think law, gospel, you can think prom demands, when you think of law, demands, and promises. And Luther's going to say, this is the key. If you can't distinguish between law and gospel, you are going to read scripture and it is not going to go well for you. So, let's see what he means by all this. In one of his longest writings, and one that when he got to the end of his life, he said, this is really my best work. Very hard to understand. Greg Patterson has actually read the whole thing. I have to tip my hat to Greg um, on that. Um, the Bondage of the Will, this is his um, fight with the um, scholastic scholar uh, Erasmus. And... Um, in that writing, he says this, Now, I ask you, what good will anyone do in a matter of theology or holy writ, holy scriptures, who has not yet got as far as knowing what the law and the gospel is? Or if he knows, disdains to observe the distinction between them. Such a person is bound to confound everything. Heaven and hell, life and death, and he will take no pains to know anything at all about Christ. Wow, Luther. You're going to do theology, if you're going to read the Holy Scripture, you better know what the law and the gospel is. Otherwise, you're going to confound everything, Luther says. All right, well, let's see here. All right, that was that. Um, now, this is fascinating, as I did a search on law and gospel in all of my Luther's works. Um, this is from his lectures on the Psalms in 1515. Now I think 1517 is the, you know, Wittenberg door, you know, the 95 Theses, and then onward we go. But this is before all of that, before Luther got in trouble, as he's now be getting, got a doctorate in the Scriptures. I mean, he had been sent by his Augustinian order to get a doctorate in the Scriptures, and he's pouring through the Scriptures, and he's 
By this time, he, used, he did the psalms every day, and I guess by the end of his life, he had all the 150 psalms memorized. That's what people say. Um, so he lectured on those, and he, he, that was one of the first things he did was lecture on the psalms. And this is a little note about law and gospel from those lectures. So this is early Luther. But you can see already he's saying that the law and gospel distinction is really important. So let's read this. This touches the difference between law and gospel. For the law is the word of Moses. So when you think of law, Luther will talk a lot about Moses. That comes up to us, Adnos. While the gospel is the word of God that comes into us. In nos. I guess that's why. The former remains outside and speaks of figures and visible shadows of things to come. But the latter comes inside and speaks of internal, spiritual, and true things. It is one thing to speak into us. It's another to speak to us. Uh, Luther, what are you talking about here? When he speaks into us, he is effective and captures us. Remember, he talks about being absorbed by the word. It gets into us. It's into our very being. He is effective and captures us, but not at all when he speaks to us. So, the gospel, the word comes to us and that captures us, but the word of faith like a two-edged sword. So, that's what Hebrews 4.12 says. So the word has two edges to it. Law and gospel. Um, it penetrates into the inner parts and instructs and sanctifies the spirit. But the word of the law trains and sanctifies only the flesh. In other words, so this law of Moses, it keeps me on the right track. I do the right things. It does, it's an outward focus. It's like, it's like a law. Why do I not speed on the freeway? There's only one reason. It's because that highway patrolman is right there around the corner as you come around. He's always there, you know. That's why I don't speed, because I've got... No, I have yes, yes, I have. Okay, so um, that's the law. It doesn't change my inner person. It, it makes me, on the outward way, do what I'm supposed to do. That's the law. But the gospel, the word, is kind of transformative. It comes inside. It makes a change in me, in us. So this is early Luther. So already he's law and what they'll call here a word. He doesn't quite use the word gospel. but um, So that's interesting. So let's keep going reading from Luther. This is from his commentary on Galatians. I wish that you students of sacred scripture would equip yourselves with such parables in order to retain now we've got a real clear distinction between law and gospel better. Namely, that trying to be justified by the law is like counting it's like, okay, so he goes, like, trying to be justified, made righteous, innocent before God, perfect, um, holy, all of this is involved in justification. So, but trying to do that by the law is like, he starts going off on a rant here, um, counting money out of an empty purse, eating and drinking from an empty dish and cup, uh, looking for strength and riches where there's nothing but weakness and poverty. Uh, laying burden upon someone who is already oppressed to the point of collapse. Trying to spend a hundred gold pieces and not having even a pittance. Taking clothing away from a naked person. Imposing even greater weakness and poverty upon someone who is sick and needy. That's what trying to be justified by the law is like. I love, I love that language. So that's... Notice you've got to distinguish between the law and the gospel. The law does not justify, the gospel does. This is from his table talk. This is, um, a lot of people doubt the authenticity, but you can take it with a grain of salt, but it sounds like Luther to me. And these are people that sat around while they were having some drink and food, and they were writing everything down, he said. Wouldn't you love to have that happen to you? No. <laughs> the Martha Mary beer passports were bad enough. <laughs> he 
He says, so don't be too daring. The distinction between law and gospel will do it. The devil turns the word upside down. If one sticks to the law, one is lost. A good conscience won't set one free, but the distinction between law and the gospel will. So you should say, the word is twofold. On the one hand, terrifying, and on the other hand, comforting. So the law would be what? Terrifying. The gospel would be comforting. Here Satan objects. But God says, you are damned because you don't keep the law. So Satan rushes in with the law and says, you're damned. You're going to hell. You're, you're horrible. You're rotten. You, didn't, you messed up. Any of you been there? Okay. Um, I respond... God also says, so yeah, God's law is there. That's right, Satan can use that. But, God's, but God also says, I shall live. His mercy is greater than sin and life is stronger than death. Hence, if I have left this or that undone, our Lord will treat it, tread it underfoot with his grace. Gospel. Amen. Amen. Now, does that guy know how to preach or what? No, tread in un the things done and left done, undone, underfoot. Just love that. That's law and gospel. And notice now he inserts the adversary. What does the adversary like to do with the law? He likes to come in and say, You're falling short. You didn't measure up. You, there's no place for you with those holy people. Now, in other places, and I don't know that I have quotes from this, he'll say, now the other thing the devil does, he comes in and says, good job, you kept the law. You're really good. You're just fine. You're basically a good person. You haven't murdered anybody, or you haven't had adultery, you haven't done this and that and this. You, you're just great. In fact, you give tithing, you give 10%. You are so good. You, you're just great. The devil either comes in and uses the law to make us despair or move us into self-righteousness. And in either place, where do we meet Christ? And the gospel comes in and says the things left done and undone. And then opposite of that, all of your good things you have done, that doesn't cut it either, depend solely on Christ. All right, so beautiful. So there it is, a distinction between law and gospel and how important that is. So, um, a big concern with Luther, and a lot of people will say that this was 500 years ago, that human beings aren't kind of crushed by conscience anymore, like Luther was, that, that this was a very medieval thing, you know, people were told they're going to hell and it's so, they're so bad and evil and rotten, and that this was Luther's kind of, you know, introspective conscience, and there's, a, there's some truth to that. <laughs> Um, perhaps first century people were not, in Jesus' day, so stricken by an individual guilty conscience. I think that's overdone when I read Paul and I read there's a concern about doing things wrong and doing things right. But maybe it was intensified 500 years ago. But what about today? Do people today still have this guilty conscience? Well, it's different. Some do if they've known the law. But a lot of people don't know the law. They've never encountered the law, so they don't have that. But they sure are working awful hard to justify themselves, whether they know it or not. i got to be successful. I've got to um, be liked by all my peers. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to. And then the advertisements. You better look like this. You better get this car. You better this. You better that. And people are striving after the wind. And it's just different, but it's the same, in my opinion. Anyway, so people still have this conscience inside. And Luther says, knowing the distinction between law and gospel is the key to comforting your conscience. Because the law is, is there, and it's going to get your conscience revved up. Yes, Dave? First of all, this is not the devil. This, okay, <laughs> it's nice to know this is not the devil intervening at this point. Do we got a microphone back there? Can we, let's just so everybody can hear right behind you. Perfect. Yeah, there we go. And in all of this, this is uh, small potatoes. But going back to one of your first uh, yep. uh, um, presentations out there, uh, you said that the, um, the law is the word of Moses. And the gospel is the word of uh, God. Right. But didn't 
Moses receive the word from God and determine yes. whether it be think where it is the Ten Commandments or the laws coming yeah. down. Yeah. So it's kind of getting in my way is to help yeah. me over that hump, but sure. uh, it seems like one then I can pay attention. <laughs> sum up like pages and pages for you. So he said, he distinguished between the law of Moses and the word of God. Luther would certainly say the law of Moses was God's word to the people, but he's going to try and distinguish between what was given to the Jewish people, not Jewish at the time, Israelites, the Hebrews, wandering in the wilderness, and Luther will go through and say there's a core in those laws that apply to everybody universally, especially the part that agrees with kind of natural laws, he'll, he'll talk about it. Um, but some of those, some of that stuff doesn't apply to us today. That was for the Jewish people, the Israelites in that time. So, but Luther will still go on to say something Paul says in Galatians, that that covenant was temporary. In Galatians, Paul says that the law, and I think he's thinking of Moses now, was a custodian until Christ. So he wouldn't say, I, th I don't think Luther would say that that wasn't God's word. But he is elevating the law. He's distinguishing. Maybe that's a better word. Moses is the law. The Ten Commandments. This is what you do. It's that part that works on the outside. But the word of God, as Luther's using it here, is capital W, Jesus, the Gospel. So, I don't know, am I helping? I feel much better. Okay. okay. Please, now you can listen to the rest of the... Um, it's, it's hard to... It, 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 what's beautiful about your comment, Dave, is that this is an issue that Luther has to deal with in his theology. What about the law? The Apostle Paul has the same problem. Okay, if the, if the gospel of Christ does something that the law actually maybe tried to do but never could do, what's, what good is the law um, and this is something that we we wrestle with, you know, and still do. Please, Marietta. So you, you talked about Galatians. Um, in the second chapter, 19 and 20, it says, For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And now the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So it feels to me like, an, oh, thank you. <laughs> there it is. You're, you're so handy. Um, it just feels like he kind of, that's his thought process there, a little bit. The law yes. is necessary. Yes. Is that, yes. to call a thing what it is. Yes. But then, but we can't fulfill it on our own, so then he brings Christ, is, is that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, he's going to say... Well, one, Jim Nestigan summed up what Luther says about Moses and the law as Moses, he said, I've heard him say it this way, Moses doesn't get you into the promised land. Did he get him into the promised land? He never came. He never got to go. Is there a significance to that? I mean, do you know the one little mistake he made that got him? You should read, go home and check that out. That's your home. I, when I read that, it's like, come on, God, give him a break. He went with all these people for 40 years, man, and he did all these great things, and he makes one mistake, and he doesn't get to go into the promised land. What is up with that? Well, well, there you go. See, there's a different covenant, and that covenant doesn't get, that, Moses doesn't get you into the promised land. Anyway, so, so interesting. Thank you, Mary. That's a perfect text that Luther is working off of to distinguish law and gospel. So, good. Other comments here? Please. I just have one. Did, did Luther, so we're blocking off law, but we spent last week and maybe the week before trying to dissect what laws apply and the rest of that. Yep. I'm assuming that Martin Luther had this, we talked about that, about this dissection of Leviticus. Yes. That did, he, did he ever get to a point where we're still generalizing on the law, that he kind of started so dividing the laws out like this that we've been trying to do as well. He did. And if you look at, um, again, that writing 
Um, oh, I'm trying to remember the name of it exactly, but it's on how to read Moses or something like that. Um, he does have criteria of what applies versus what doesn't. Um, and what was particular to the Jewish people in that time, and what is universal. So he does, yeah, yeah. Which, of course, everybody does whether they know it or not, because everybody, nobody, well, that's not true. There are people, actually, the ultra-Orthodox Jewish people come fairly close to keeping all, you know, 600 plus laws, but, you know, even Jewish people say, like, Reformed Jews will say, well, this is what we, apply and this is what we don't. So, yeah. But Luther did, and he had some very clear criteria on it. But please also hear, Luther wasn't saying, we don't need the law. He would never say that. You just have to distinguish. That's the important word. Now, there were people who, followers, a guy named Agricola, who, it's the, called the antinomian controversy, antinomian law, anti-anti-law. In other words, it said, we don't need the law at all. Now, and Luther said, no, 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 you can't do that. Yeah. Okay, Kevin, and then Glory. Yeah. I jumped over it, but um, what were the Israelites before they were Jewish? Um, Hebrews. And that, that, that's, yeah. So the, the term Jewish, although used to describe all the people all the way back, Jewish comes from the southern kingdom, Judah. Judah was the southern tribe. Benjamin is kind of a part of that. Um, tribe, and so that Judah is what survives to the time of Jesus, in essence, and so that's where we get the word Jewish from, but, so going back, they, in the time of the um, slavery in Egypt, they would be known as Hebrews, but then um, Israelites was also a part of that because Jacob has his name changed to Israel, and off we go, um, so, but yeah, the term Jewish is not until much later. Yeah. Okay. Gloria. Well, could it be that without the law, we wouldn't really see our need for the gospel? I mean, all through the Old Testament and the law, it's pointing to Christ, trying to sacrifice. Yes. Well said in Lutheran theology. Right there. <laughs> so, one of the things, and I... Lutherans have wrestled with two uses or three uses of the law. So what is good is the law? The second theological use, Gloria, is what you just said. It drives us to Christ. And I'll talk some more about that. Yeah. Now, the other one is that it also shows us what it is to have a God and to have a neighbor. I mean, we still need that fence, that boundary, that guide, I guess you could say. And, and Luther doesn't do away with that. I saw, I saw in the back. Yes, please, Jim. Well, I, I guess the way I view myself is living in between most of the time. Yeah. I, I, I put my face in the, the law. Go closer, I can't hear you. I like to put my face in the law. I can do this. I can manage this. I can handle this. So yeah. I need the help. And then falling short on that, I find myself in need of help in the gospel. We release that. And I, I, I kind of, I want to say, bounce back and forth in between. And I just, I'm constantly wrestling with uh, me versus God. Amen. And because we have both natures, Christ in us and the old person, we're going to have that battle our whole life. That's why we need the word. That's why we need law as law and gospel. I saw another. Okay. All right, good. Let's keep going. So this is from his um, lectures on Isaiah. He says, the prophet compares law and gospel. The law is sad wailing. The voice of the gospel is a most agreeable voice for the afflicted consciences. Nothing is more agreeable to the conscience. Why? Because the law confirms our conscience that, man, I missed, I messed up. You know, and if you read the Bible and you read all these do's and don'ts and all these things that God requires, all the demands of Moses, even the demands of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, be perfect like your Father in Heaven. Don't Get angry against your brother, otherwise you're a murderer. You know, all of this stuff, you read that, and the conscience will, if it's honest, which Luther's was, for all his faults, that's one thing he was, he was honest, will go, I'm doomed. I can't measure up. 
I'll never forget in my office, in my last um, congregation, um, I had a gal that came out of more of a holiness um, tradition of Christianity, more of a Moses-driven part of Christianity. Do this, do that, and if you keep doing, you can almost become perfected in this life. And I'll never forget her sitting with tears in her eyes and saying, Pastor Bill, I can't be a Christian. Because she couldn't do it. She couldn't measure up to their standards. And I said, you can do it here. Because we don't really have standards. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> no, I said, I said, we have the standards, but you're not, you're just here. What is what was she just hearing the word as? Law. Law. And there was no gospel. So you gotta hold these in distinction. But, and hold them together. They, it comes to us both as law and gospel. So what, what the word does, we're still working on this, and I'm, and I'm talking about um, law and gospel. So let's, now that we've got the concepts, and Gloria really helped us, we typically, as Luther will say, you have to read the Bible and you have to understand when you're reading law and gospel. And the gospel doesn't negate the law. Let me give an example this way with the Sermon on the Mount. Um, there is a, there's been some readings recently, uh, well actually not from the Sermon on the Mount, but from Mark. And Jesus talks about um, your treasures and, you know, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he gives some real stern warnings about mammon and treasures. In Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus say? You cannot serve God and... Mammon. So, he's got some real clear things to warn us about wealth, warn us about our priorities in life. Now, sometimes Lutherans would say, oh, he's just doing the second use of the law. He's just trying to drive us to his cross. Which is true. He is. When I read that, I go, I'm guilty. And I fall on my knees to the cross. But... He isn't saying that there still isn't a first use of the law. Jesus is teaching us what we do with our possessions is really important. It's not either or, it's both and. First and second use. So when you read Jesus, you need this distinction. Oftentimes Jesus preaches the law. And oftentimes, all the time, he is the gospel. So, so you need this distinction even with Christ. Let me clear up right away. The law is not the Old Testament, and the gospel is not the New Testament. You haven't read them if you think that. There's all kinds of law in the Old Testament, and all kinds of gospel in the Old Testament. There's incredible good news in the Old Testament. I, you know, like, let's do, Mo we can even get Moses in here. What's the first part of the Ten Commandments? You know it. I am your God. The Lord your God. That's gospel. God claiming us. That we got law. We got law in there. So, so you look at the word chesed in Hebrew, which is God's steadfast, loving kindness. We can't even translate in English. His covenant love. It's all over the Old Testament. And there is law in the New Testament. Read the book of Revelation, man. Whoa! This is the problem, is we read that book and we don't distinguish between law and gospel. So all of it, it, it law and gospel and the whole thing. So what does the word do? What does the word do? Um, let's see. Let me see. Let me see. Um, Richard! <laughs> what, what, did you hear what he said? <laughs> was I sleeping? <laughs> and he wasn't. I mean, I picked out. I made sure not to pick out somebody that was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Bobby, can you check the thermos because about this high up, I am about ready to throw up. All right, it's getting hot. So maybe I'm just fired up today. All right. So the first thing that the word does is it makes a connection, just like I did. When I said Richard's name. Now sometimes when he hears his name, he says, what did I do? <laughs> See, the word comes as law sometimes. But, so the, but when the word of God comes, it makes a connection. That's what it does. 
Um, but it also answers the question, what is the connection between us and God like? What is God's attitude and orientation to us and to all of humanity? Is God ultimately a vengeful, horrible, wrathful God, even though there is plenty of wrath there to go around? Given our disobedience and distrust and how much we mess things up here? Yes, but is that who God is? This is what the word is going to say. It's going to say, what's, who's, what is the contact like? We'll keep going on that. So the nature of the contact is important. Um, and so the word comes, makes connection, and it develops and strengthens our relationship to God. And so that's where law and gospel comes in, and so we'll give some examples of that here. So everyone has a lens of which they read scripture. So a lot of people will criticize law and gospel because it's, Scripture doesn't say, no, this is all law, and this is gospel. But this is what Luther discovered as he reads Scripture. It, it, there's all these demands, and then there's all these promises. And so law and gospel. And this is the way he could read. He could read um, Scripture and not despair or not fall into self-righteousness. So, our lens is the law and the gospel. It's our way of viewing scripture one way, and it's the key to understanding and reading the, God, the Bible like we've already talked about. So, what's an example of law? Um, let's just, uh, let's go to one of these as I'm looking at time. I want to make sure I don't run out of time. Whoops, I didn't type in second schedule, did I? So this is a point in David's, King David's life where he's done some awful things. What has he done? What are the bad things he did? Come on. He killed Uriah, but before that, adultery. adultery with Bathsheba. So he actually put out a hit on Uriah because he made sure he got put in the front line. So he's an adulterer, and is that called first degree murder? <coughs> so, yeah. So... God sends to him Nathan. Now, who is Nathan? Do you know? He's a prophet. What do prophets do? Speak the word. So here comes the word of God to David. There, um, he, David Nathan says to David, There were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. He brought it up. It grew up with him, with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Sounds like my dog. <laughs> now, there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But, but, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. <laughs> then David's anger, after hearing this story, was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he has done this thing and because he had no pity. <laughs> David said, you are the man. Nathan, sorry. Nathan said, David, you are the man. Now, what is this we're hearing? Law. Law, exactly. Now, is this kind of, this is the bad thing about the, the kind of more heady Lutheran, the law shows us our sin, the gospel forgives it, you know. It's much more dynamic. The law exposes, encounters us in the mirror, face to face with the things done and left undone. Because what happens to us in this life? Maybe we're not as bad as David, hopefully, and we're not in that big of denial, but that's what happens. We start to think, oh, it wasn't that bad. I'm the, you know, 
Well, I said that to him because da -da 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 -da, here we go down the path. And the law comes and says, you are the woman. You are the man. Boom. Okay, that's law. We can look at the Adam and Eve story. I've done this many times with most, a lot of you, right? Mark, Adam and Eve. Eve is a tough catch. The serpent has to work on her and work on her. You'll be like, God, he didn't mean that. All this, Eve shows Adam the apple. And like, oh, he, was, that was, he was easy, but Eve was hard. And so they both eat of the tree. They're in trouble. They're hiding. They know they're naked, they're, they're good and evil, all of this, and they go, and they are hiding, and God comes walking in the cool of the garden, and he says what? When the word comes as law, it says, where are you? What are you doing? Where are you? And so they go on, and Adam, what have you done? The woman that you gave to be with me, she did it, and I ate. He goes to the woman, the woman points to the serpent. Like I say, we've done this many, thousands of times, it's good for you to hear it again. And so the woman points to the serpent. What are they both doing, and what's the one word they won't say? There's the shortest word in the English language. I. The law gets us to say. need this in our marriages? Don't we need this in our relationships? Don't we need this in the church the force of the law to say, hey, stop blaming. What are you doing? I'll never forget listening to a psychologist as I was working on my pastoral care training and all of this stuff, and he said, Bill, there's only one purpose for therapy. It's to get people to stop blaming. And look, we all do it, and we need to do it, but moving from blame to what are we going to do about it is, is a big deal. And, and the law gets us to take a look at us and say, well, what have you done? You know, boom. So, oh my goodness, can you feel the weight of this right now? I mean, you're like, get me out of this room. This is sad, this is depressing, this is horrible. Well, that's the law. But it's the God, the Word of God, if all you had was the law, you are going to give it up. You're going to throw in the towel. But thank goodness, there is gospel. I mean, we could look. Um, so when we th review the law, it exposes, it opens our eyes to the situation, it causes us to confess, I, me. But then you look at passages like Luke, where Jesus sees this woman with a hemorrhage bent over, and he touches her, and he stands her. That's gospel. Paul says that, yes, under the law, we're all in trouble. But in the gospel, Jesus, in the, our baptism, we are connected to Christ. And now all that is Christ is ours. And, and he's taken our sin and now given us and filled us with his whole righteousness. That's the gospel. That's what he did in the cross and resurrection. I love first, 2 Corinthians 15. Um, God reconciled us to God's self. That is powerful. In Christ. So, so when you read scripture, man, you, no matter whether you're reading the book of Deuteronomy or the book of Revelation or a letter of Paul, be thinking law and gospel. My goodness, even think about a sermon. Is Pastor Bill hitting on law right now? Where did he talk about the gospel? And if you didn't hear the gospel, you better write me an email. I'm serious. Where was the gospel, Pastor Bill? All I got was law today. So, um, I, I talked about that. Uh, uh, I want to. I want us to work with this distinction, and rather just heard me talk about it. So I'm going to just give you one more analogy, which again I've used in my basics class, and and, and in other ways, and then we'll see. You be thinking about a passage or a story in the Bible, and let's play with it from law gospel. Okay? But that's what we'll do in a minute. So, Valentine's Day, um, Valentine's Day uh, comic 
way back, 30 plus years ago, I remember seeing this. And it's two frames. The first frame is a guy in a room. You know, he's got this determined, kind of like angry but proud look. And he's got his arms folded. And the room he's in, it's a cool little cartoon, the room he's in is all boarded up. Every window is boarded up, the door is boarded up, there's no way in, and he's like, yeah. The other frame. Same man, same boarded up room. He's looking down under the door where a little valentine had been slipped through. That's the gospel. That's the word. That's the word. That's how it comes to us. It breaks through. Um, and that's, that's all of Scripture together. I mean, that's the whole story. Uh, so, so if you don't distinguish between these two, you're in trouble. Self-righteousness or despair. Here's the problem I see in a lot of people in modern, modernity in our culture. When they look at the church, because we take ethics seriously, whether it's more on the liberal side or the conservative side, they see that in the church, and that's what they think the church is. And if they fit with whatever that church says is this is holiness, whatever lists we have, and believe me, in Christianity we have different lists. I'd love to write a book someday on standards of holiness. And go to the Baptists. And what are the things the Baptists really champion? Go to the, the Missouri Synod Lutherans. What are the things they really champion? Go to the ELCA Lutherans. What do they really champion? Go to the Presbyterians. What do they champion? Just, it'd be fun to get the whole breadth of it. But the culture sees that. And they, what do they see? They see law. The problem isn't the law. The problem is they haven't seen and experienced the gospel. So, the church is in a predicament, isn't it? We still got to make our stands and talk about righteousness, but boy, equally, we have to give the gospel. We have to give the gospel, and we do. We do here. Um, some churches, I, I like to call them law, gospel, law churches. You hear the law, I'm a sinner. I come to Christ, and then every Sunday I get more law. We are law gospel, law gospel church. <laughs> you may be in Christ, but every Sunday you need both. Right? Okay, so let's think of, we've got ten minutes. Let's think of some stories or scripture verses and think about them. How would we see that as law and gospel or where we'd see that? Greg, please. When the... Uh when Jesus was on the cross with the two thieves and one was mocking him, the other said, you know, we've been rightfully condemned. But the last man, so there's the law. The yes. two thieves were crucified for the law. Yeah. And then Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Ah, there's the gospel. Nice. Nice. Beautiful. Nice. Please, Dave. Yeah. <clears throat> two quick stories. First of all, I went to a Lutheran program in school. Yes. Somewhere we had it better than online. A pastor on Sunday morning spent, out of the 20 minute sermon, 10 minutes on law, 10 minutes on gospel. Oh. Is that the way you were learned uh, in the seminary? That's a great question. No. And so, two things that I was, <coughs> some of the things that your comment or question brings up that I would say as far as my homiletics training, sometimes it'll be 19 minutes. Law and one beautiful minute of God. Sometimes. Sometimes. Right. Yeah, please. That leads me to my second story. Okay. <laughs> Sue, Sue and I, one afternoon, went to a presentation about some uh, resort up north yeah. Minnesota. And uh, it turned out while we made a visit there, it was all for a uh, battery operated swizzle stick. Prize for <laughs> that was the prize. But, but in the presentation itself, uh, for no particular reason, I was sitting there with my arms crossed as you were uh, showing us. Yeah. And the presenter that day said, now, I know some of you are 
resisting what I'm saying. And I can tell who you are because you sit there with your arms crossed. <laughs> I looked down, and sure enough, there it was. There you are with your arms. So, uh, this, I never forgot that. And yeah. I find myself, even at church, if I'm listening to your sermon or yeah. to a sermon, and I find my arms crossed, I immediately uncross it. <laughs> I love that so, story. So, anyway. Yeah. Story. I love that story because you're, you're, you're thinking about what is my posture and how open am I? And, and maybe I'm going to start when I'm preaching because I'm always looking at you. There's, you know, there's good, good pros and cons to all kinds of different ways of preaching. But one thing is the way I preach is I can see in what's going on for you. I usually look at my wife and she's like going. Oh. <laughs> I gotta I got, I got take I gotta go a different way. Um, but I'm gonna be looking for your arms. Yeah. And if you're like this, I'm gonna go, well, I must be preaching the law. Like everybody's like, oh, this is great. By the end of the sermon, they're like this. I got some work to do. That's great. The other thing, um, you know, when Preaching, you have to be careful. A lot of preach homiletics, preaching instruction is like, you don't need to do 19 minutes of law because people live from Monday to Sunday. And they know the law. So, you know, if you get up there and start hammering, you know, so we have to be, as a preacher, I have to be careful and think about that because sometimes even one word of law is all that got heard in that sermon. So it's a challenge. So I, you, you've got to be ready for the gospel. And that especially happens when we talk about money. But, okay, um, over here, please. Yeah. When you're checking us out to see if we're having our arms crossed, yes. remember to check the temperature as well. Check the temperature. <laughs> <laughs> you mean it might be just because it's freezing cold? <laughs> no, I know the psychology behind it. <laughs> That's a great, that's great. Um, over here, to Kim, or is there others? Was there another? Okay, yeah. Kim. What about something, what about something that has caused schism in, in the different church, like the teachings about um, the instructions for the church in Second Timothy? Yes. What particular, just so everybody knows what you're talking about, instructions. Well, like the exhortation about how female pastors, for example. Right. And or what, even to speak in church. Right, or women, or women to speak in church. So what? What about that? How does? How does? Okay, let's work with that. So in Timothy it says, "I permit no woman to have authority over a man," um, and you know the woman fell first, and then the man. So the woman, you know, it's pretty and stuck there. Um, so how do we hear a passage like that as law and gospel? And does law and gospel help us? With Okay, so you just, no, <laughs> Ken, give it a shot, yeah, please, yeah, there you go, Mike, yeah. I think God made it clear is, you know, uh, a good lawyer can make the case that it's Eve's fault, but God is holding Adam accountable, yeah, so guys, you can't dodge it, yes, okay, good, 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 so one way to look at it is, Hey, if we're gonna, if the law has been around, got, you know, the men are not, um, do not escape the blame, even though it seems like Eve is given more of it or primary. Okay, yeah, yeah. Hmm. So when I hear that passage, first of all. I guess I hear the first use of the law that this is instruction on how to live and how to be. And so the first thing I would think of, okay, under the first use of the law, not necessarily the second use, the first use, I'd say, okay, what did that word mean in that time? Um, so we got to let that stand. What was the concern in Timothy? What was going on at that time? And so we look at that. And then... Under the first use of the law, we got to look at other scriptures. Because we don't want to just look at just that verse. If we're thinking about, okay, this is instruction on how we're to be, so then we go to other passages. Um, and we go to Romans 16, where a woman is superlative among the apostles, and Phoebe is a deacon, a 
And some people say, I'm just a servant. But actually, by that time, Romans is written. Deacons were a position of authority. So what the church did back in the 70s, in the Lutheran side of things, and I, I is that, wait, okay, it says this here, it says this here, which one gets to have the sway? And then, going to the gospel part, um, Paul in Galatians says that in Christ now, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. Now, our Missouri Synod and other parts of the Christendom that don't have the leadership of women will rush in real quick and say, that's talking about your vertical relationship with God, not horizontal, not how you work this way. Um, that's your spiritual. It's, Paul was saying spiritually before God, we're neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. But there's still those distinctions horizontally. And if, if that's true, I just simply want to say, evidently then we can still have slaves. And evidently, we need to have a special place in that sanctuary for anyone of Jewish descent. Because they did in the temple. So, so we have said, uh, or our expression of the Lutheran faith, has said, when we look at the gospel, that does change role. It does have an effect on how we, what gender roles there are and, and, and whatnot. So it would be two things. Under the first use of the law, I would say, well, any time we're talking first use, we have to look at all the scriptures, not just one passage. And then we look at the context. And I would say in Timothy, um, there's something going on underneath the surface here. Some, something, when it comes to the leadership of women, has, has become a problem. I've read some articles, and I think I'm fairly persuaded by them, that by this time... And some people even debate whether Paul wrote Timothy. It might have been an apostle of Timothy. But that's speculation. And it has some good reason. It's very different linguistics in the writing and vocabulary. And there's all kinds of reasons to say that. But nonetheless, it's scripture. And so what did it mean then? Well, maybe by then there were some prophetesses or some women that were preaching some heresy or something, and so, boom, we're just going to shut it down, which is very unfortunate because Paul, in a lot of his other writings, talk, talks about women as fellow laborers in the gospel. He, I mean, this was a term he uses for my, my equals, my partners in ministry, and he doesn't say anything there except for this, this, and this. Um, and then you go to um, Acts 2, where men and women in, in the last days shall preach and proclaim um, because of that text, Pentecostals have had women pastors for many, many, many years, way before the... the so, so that's the way I'd go on uh, gospel with so that. So you might Please. have to look elsewhere to find the gospel. Absolutely. Sometimes in scripture, it is just law. And the gospel, so, you know, it, I have this problem in preaching sometimes. Like sometimes the gospel reading is law. It's like, where do I, I got to go to Paul or I got to, yeah. you know, yeah. Great, great question. Heidi. this, um, didn't Jesus perhaps set an example for us when he was confronted with the Pharisees as they were constantly throwing scripture or the law in his face and he took it and turned it around and showed them the gospel oh. in the law that they were trying to say and perhaps that's an example for us to use? I don't know, am I? I think you're right on. I, uh, I'm trying to think, how about the how about the Pharisee and the, um, the publican, the tax collector and the Pharisee, the one standing at a distance, I'm a sinner, I can't approach God, I'm so sorry, and the other one is, um, I've done all the right things. And Jesus says, who goes away justified? The one who'd done everything right, who had kept the law, or the one who was repenting? And he says, no, the one who's repentant. But also, yeah, I'm trying to think, um, Jesus, you just healed somebody on the Sabbath. That was wrong. According to the law, it was. But Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. He, you know, so, so and then he touched and healed someone and brought the gospel. Um, yeah, 
give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to, to God what belongs to God. He was great in the first use of the law. <laughs> and the, how do you apply it? But yeah, I, I think you're right. I think Jesus oftentimes to those Pharisees showed, you guys are trying to justify yourself by the law and it ain't going to work. And I, I think, um, and then he pointed them to the gospel and tried to. Um, how about the rich man from a few weeks ago? What must I do to inherit eternal life? I've done this, this, and this, and this, and this. And Jesus says, well, go and do those. You've done great. He says, bah. And Jesus says, oh, well, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the rich man goes away. Sad. I think later he came back. I'm not just kidding. I really think that. But anyway, we don't hear that part. because So Jesus says, hey, you're trying to get the law to do something it isn't intended to. It can't do. And he shows over and over and over it can't. So sometimes he intensifies the law. But I, you, that's a great comment, Heidi. I think there's a lot to do that. All right, I can see we're out of time. I hope nothing I want more as one of your pastors is to help you open up that book and start to read. Don't, if you don't understand, that's fine. There's lots you want to understand. It's enough there for the rest of our lives and for 20 more lives. We've got 2,000 years of biblical commentaries being written. It's a part of the way it's supposed to work. But please don't forget the distinction between law and gospel. You have that, you have the key to letting the Word of God absorb you into Christ. Thank you. God's peace. We'll see you next week. And next week we're going to do overview of New Testament stuff. A little bit of Old Testament. We can still get in there. But we got to get moving. So we'll do that through like the end of November. And then we'll take a change. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.